This is where we hold them. This is where we fight. Now listening to Sweep the Rack Podcast featuring Brooklyn Rob and Big Mike. Rob, what's good, homie? Mike, 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 Mike. Guess what day it is? Thursday night, man. We are back on air. Thursday nights, dude. We haven't been on Thursday nights in a, in a really long time. So, uh... Good to uh, be back uh, talking some bowling. There's been a lot of shit going on this week, uh, especially shows and whatnot. So uh, I don't know where you want to get started here. I know we got a guest. Uh, we already see the the chat. Hashtag free Flanagan. It's already it's trending on the chat. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a, a, a wild night tonight, I think, here. But, uh, Mike, I know you were talking about your betting I don't know if you want to get right into it. We're not doing league review. We're saving league review for Sunday night. Well, We're saving worst of the week for Sunday night. You're giving you're giving the people behind the scenes uh, access here because, like, I I came on uh, a few minutes early to chop it up with you, and the first thing I said to you is that, and people, please don't take this the wrong way. Love love the sweep the rack uh, little community we have here, but I didn't really want to do this podcast tonight. I'm fried. Your boy is fried from bowling. Okay, I, I I need to I honestly I need to not be around anything bowling related for at least at least twenty four hours. Okay, hopefully I'm ready to go for the shows on Saturday. But your your boy got juice today. Okay, like a like a piece of fruit that just gets squeezed for all it's worth. That's that's kind of what happened to me today. Uh, sometimes I think I'm the world's best bowling better. And sometimes I think I'm the bowling world's biggest black cloud. Uh, it depends what day it is. It depends what, what hour it is, what block it is. Uh, so, oh, it was a rough day. That's all I'm betting, betting round Robin. First of all, shout the bet rivers, shout the bet rivers for giving us all uh, option to bet basically every game and match play today except the position round. I, I I I was tapped out, so I didn't even look. But uh, shout to Bet Rivers for giving us the opportunity to bet on all these uh, mat, round robin match play games. But oh my God, Rob, betting on round robin match play is hard. Betting on round robin match play is really really hard. It's so much harder than betting the best out of five or the best out of seven. There's just so much more involved. It's such a quicker pace. You got to really be paying attention to what's going on. Uh, I, I just, uh, I'm fried. I, Doyle, Doyle in the chat saying I sound like Tommy Hag. I do. I do. I'm fried, Hoss. I'm fried, um, please. Yeah, uh, I stayed away from betting a lot during this World Series. And a lot of that reason why is the unpredictability of like everything going on the last two weeks. And I know we'll talk more in the shows and we'll talk when Mike comes on and stuff about what he's kind of observed. But the minute that first pattern went down in Cheetah and, you know, the left looked good and the scores were high and we saw so many unknown names was the first indicator for me to kind of stay away a little bit. Um, unless, like, I'm sure. See, you're different better than I am. I'm a lot safer better than you are. You, you, you're you you're of a gambler mentality more than I do. Uh, I like sure bets. I texted you last night. You know, we'll talk a little bit. I was like, Mike, this is the bet right here. Like, take it. Trust me. And we did, and we cashed. Uh, but I didn't bet a lot. And you're firing it in. I love you. About, I, I, I love you for that. But, man, I mean, you got to, like, <laughs> you're out of control sometimes with your parlays. You put in three, four, five leggers, you know, like just kind of like wilding out on the Bet Rivers app, man. I mean, they, they must love you. Listen, I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna get – I'll start it off with one bet, and then and then we're bringing we're bringing our guest on. We're bringing our guest on because because we we care about the bowling community, okay. But before we bring them on, 
just as an example, Rob, uh, the other night on the show, uh, Kevin Kevin Williams was bowling Jesper Svensson, okay? And at the end of that game, uh, Jesper, at the end of the first game, Jesper's ball reaction kind of like went away. And you could see him in the fill ball throw another ball, and he was like kind of fishing. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, you know, it doesn't look like he has a real good look. And Kevin Williams was the dog in that match. All right. So just just as an example of what you were talking about, just in that game, in that game alone, Kevin Williams versus versus uh yes for Svensson, I went uh I went Kevin Williams to win and the under, okay. 20 to win 90 Kevin Williams to win straight up 20 to win 45 and Kevin Williams plus 9.5 40 to win 75. And I won all three bets. Okay. In, in, in that game. So like, yeah, you know, I get, uh, I get, I get a little, I get a little, you know, I mean the money amounts aren't out of control, but you're right. I do. I do like to, I do like to press the, press the action button. A little bit uh, at times, but listen, I gotta say, I've had an amazing week of watching. Two weeks, really, two weeks of watching bowling and betting on bowling. I put out a tweet at one point that I had like eight hundred in bets, and I was up about four hundred. You know, I, at this point, I don't even know. I probably have fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred in bets for the, for the week and a half, and I'm still up close to four hundred. So, you know, as, as tough as a day as I had today, and, you know, I had a lot of losses and you're right. A lot of my bets lose when I do hit them, I hit them hard. I hit them real hard. And we'll give some examples of that throughout, uh, through, throughout the night tonight. But all right, we'll, we'll get to the, if you like talking betting, you know, I love talking betting. Um, I'm like, let's just get to Mike. Rob likes to, Rob wants to limit the, the betting talk, but I will, I will limit the betting talk right now because we do have a guest. And we're gonna bring him on, but Mike Flanagan, what's good, bro? Hey, I like talking betting, guys. No, we're not talking betting just yet. We'll get to that in a bit. There's more things to talk about here. There's more important things to talk about here. Okay, Mike, we are gonna ask the question that the bowling world demands demands an answer to. Okay, do you feel me? The bowling world deserves an answer to this question, and I'm going to give you the floor. Mike, where have you been, bro? Yeah, I've been home in St. Louis. That's where I've been. Um, <laughs> been working here, doing stuff with my other businesses. So, yeah, I've been here in St. Louis. And at the Inside Bowling uh, headquarters I've got behind me here on this virtual background that I found. I, I thought that was the USBC headquarters. No, 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 this is inside bowling headquarters. I had to pay a lot of money for those lamps back there, actually. Uh, okay, so I'm going to further ask another question here is, uh, where have you been on the Bull TV uh, side of things? Uh, right now, we got a lot of bowling going on at the World Series, a lot of streaming. Uh, there's been a lot of tournaments going on, the Masters, whatnot. Uh, what's been going on? Like, what... Uh, What's been happening on your end? Milk carton, Mike Flanagan. Yeah, I, yeah. That's what I have to say, son. Yeah. Um, well, I'm watching Bolt TV right now um, to see who makes who makes it in here. Uh, did Belmo just miss? I think he might have just missed. I'm not sure. But uh, look, guys, when when it comes to uh, when it comes to this Bolt TV thing, a um, couple things I gotta I gotta say off the top. Um, USBC has given me a ton of opportunity. Okay. Over the last man, it's going on six, seven years. They've used me for a lot of different things and I cannot thank them enough. Okay. And that's all of them. Chad Murphy, Jason Overstreet, Roger Nordic, Jason Thomas, and everybody at the international bowling campus. Like I was down there recently. I've met them all. They do a lot of great work down there and they do a good job and and I and I appreciate all the work they've given me over the years. Okay. That's no doubt. Um, since I didn't work a few events, uh, I cannot thank the outpour of support for my broadcasting style 
which I would have never imagined would have happened. Honestly, I just thought I was just another dude, but for whatever reason, a bunch of people miss me. And that also includes you guys. I mean, you guys have been so nice and we've been friends. So sometimes when your friends really miss you, you know, it doesn't mean as much, although I appreciate you guys, but some of the people I've heard from on these instant messenger requests on Facebook that I've never met in my life that I just didn't realize there were so many people that enjoyed my corniness, as some people like to say. And, you know, I've got I've got three types of, of, of comfort levels. One is an extreme, um, extreme vulgarity side of me that most people wouldn't know. And I can't ever go there on air. It's too bad. Uh, and then the cool, the cool hip version of me, which is probably what I'm worst at, like what you would see on a regular show. And then there's the corny dad jokes. And I hit those out of the park <laughs> all day long. So, um, but the support that I've had from these folks is, uh, I, mean, I really can't believe it. And then the players, I can't believe how many players have reached out to me or called me and asked what's up or what's going on. And to have the respect of the players has been unbelievable as well. I didn't realize I'd hear from so many players um, just checking to make sure I was okay. You know, I wasn't, you know, dealing with something much bigger. Um, I do appreciate USBC keeping it pretty private. Our, our, our dealings with this, there's not much that's been out about this and I can't thank them enough for that as well. Um, uh, I also, and I know I'm thanking a lot of people here, uh, but I, I do want to also thank all the people that I've worked with on the road, the send the proprietors. When you go to set up a live stream, you are like in the proprietor's office, hooking into a router. You're making sure you're hitting fire codes. You know, we also had a new tournament director this year and Tony Lanning who's done a tremendous job. Uh, and Tony and I were really hitting it off. We were doing well. I love working with John Weber. When you go out to work a live stream, man, it is more than just working with your crew. It's working with everybody there. Sully on the truck gets all of your stuff there. You know, Don, everybody out there, man, they help load in your stuff. Like a lot goes into this. A lot goes into this. Okay. So working with those people, I wouldn't have been able to last as long as I did if I wasn't working with great people. I mean, that is legit. Okay. And then, uh, I also just want to let everybody know that if you follow this show, you should subscribe to Vol TV, whether there's commentary or not. Because when I was a kid, if I could have subscribed to something and watched every ball go down the lane with good commentators, bad commentators, whatever your favorite flavor is at Baskin Robbins, I think I'm mint chocolate chip, by the way. Not everybody loves mint chocolate chip, but they sell a lot of mint chocolate chip. Um, so I'm mint chocolate chip, but I think that, uh, Everybody should subscribe to Bowl TV. So with all that said, the, the biggest reason I'm not calling action on Bowl TV is, is me. I am, I am the reason I am not on Bowl TV. It is not to blame anybody else. It's me. And it's, it's, uh, it's my behavior. Uh, it's me as a 44-year-old man compared to a 35-year-old, very, very... Um, eager and anxious, uh, young man. Um, it's getting tough. It's, I mean, it's, it's gotten kind of tough and I've gotten a bit grumpy, uh, as I've gotten older out there on the road, I don't think any of it's come off on air, uh, and not with my teammates, but you know, when you, when you have those conversations about certain things, you know, needing to be better or whatever, and, and, and you, you start talking about those things, you know, I probably, I, I probably should have presented some of the things I had to say a little differently. Um, but at the same time, I was struggling with this. Do I work on my business at home or do I commit 120 days on the road uh, with Bull TV? You know, and the problem here is, is, is I feel very connected to that project, Bull TV. I, I helped build it with those folks and they, they gave me the opportunity and, and they trusted me and they still trust me. They want what's best for me. Um, I don't know what's best for me. And I told them that. And when you're in a job interview and somebody says, do you want the job? And you go, I guess. That's not the best thing you want to hear, right? And I'm really at the point where I kind of been in the, I guess, or what should I be doing? And 
you know, what's the upside with working for Bull TV for the next 10 years? You know, what's the pay increase look like, right? Or if I build my online pro shop in St. Louis or my apparel business and those sorts of things, there's way more upside to set myself up for the future. And it's kind of like Mike Fagan, right? Mike Fagan was bowling on tour. He was at the top of his game and he left because there was only so much upside and he decided to take another career, right? The, the difference in this particular situation is I didn't tell him I was leaving, but I told him what I was thinking about and they helped make the decision for me. Um, I am still on the team. I still may be used in the future, um, but I think they're really just letting me take time right now to figure out what it is that I want to do. I think if I called them tomorrow and said, guys, I figured this whole thing out. I want to commit 100% to the Bull TV project, and here's why. And I presented my case. I'd be back on the air. I think I could be back on the air. Um, but I'm really in a transitional period in my life with moving back to St. Louis. I get to see my family, um, and I get to sleep in my own bed every night. So that's kind of where I'm at right now with everything. USBC didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. It just came to this, like, point of, like, you know, what's what what should we be doing here and i would have liked to have worked an event and maybe been able to kind of sort of say goodbye to the audience or you know hey i'm going to work less or something like that uh and we've had some conversations about that but that's that that's where i've been that that's where i'm at so that's a long answer um but that's really what i'm here to tell you about that i, I really just reached out to you guys because i miss calling some bowling and talking about bowling action i've been watching these shows and i wanted to kick it with you guys tonight so uh, I understand everybody wants to know why am I not on Bull TV and that, and hopefully that helps answer some questions. If you have any follow-ups, you know, no problem. Mm, sounds like a little bit of a farewell, though, uh, speech you just gave. Like, you know, I don't know. I'm not liking the farewell speech here. Uh, I think it's uh, safe to say uh, all of our chat, too. Uh, um, you know, we miss you on the show. We really do. It's not the same. Uh, and I think we could say that as fans that watch – consistently uh and yeah man uh whatever you do we wish you the best of luck uh and honestly uh we'll support your online bowling uh pro shop we'll uh support any in future endeavors you go through and you have an open invitation anytime you want to come chat bowling mike you're always welcome if you need to get that fix in let me I, be let me I be really unequivocal agree. here okay let me be unequivocal here if bowl tv will not give mike flanagan a home Sweep the rack will gladly welcome Mike Flanagan. Okay, let's be clear. All right, let's be clear about it. Uh, Mike, I saw this comment from Lucas. Lucas, what's up? He said, uh, people don't understand what the grind is like doing bowling stream week after week until they do it. It's tough. Uh, can you can you paint the picture for our people of like, you know, what what are your what are your days like? What are your weeks like? What what is what are the what are the finer points of the grind of doing the bowling streaming thing? Well, the, the toughest part is if you're somebody who cares, um, which is, you know, somebody like me who cares, your stress level is very high, um, especially when at any given time your oxygen can be taken out from underneath you, which is the Internet connection coming into the bowl. Right. Um, I told somebody one time it would be like, imagine if somebody called the PBA and said, hey, we're going to have this event and uh, we've got everything you need. We just don't have pen setters. We've got pins, we've got lanes, we can walk the ball back up to you and everything. We just don't have pin setters, but that's okay. We got everything else we need. That'd be a very difficult tournament. The pin setter is our internet, right? And you got to have it. So that's the that's the first thing. The second thing is, is all of our equipment going to work? Is it all going to talk to one another? Are we going to be able to NDI, which is bringing in feeds from other channels? Sometimes they don't want to work. All those sorts of things uh, is what's going on. And then you work with a crew. And as this thing has evolved, you have a larger crew. And I was kind of the point guy. So I'm also dad, right? Working with younger people. And I love working with younger people. But if somebody's like, you know, even when it's time to go to lunch, hey, everybody good with Mexican? Oh, no, Mexican doesn't agree with my stomach and I got to stay up late tonight. Okay, well, is Italian okay, right? Like these are all the things that you're working on the road with a group of people. And you've only got so many rental cars. You're trying to get people to the, to the rooms. You're making sure people wake up on time. You're making sure people come in. 
uh, and then stay on task. And you've got your live reads that come in, all these different sorts of things. So you've got your, your graphic designer, you're a lead on air play by play. You're a logistics guy. You're also checking the scores and the chat rooms telling us, hey, this score's wrong in, in, in game five for Barnes. Then you like put down your headset and walk over to Tony Lanning and say, hey, there was a score input wrong. And he's like, oh, thanks a lot, man, because you're working together, right? Or he might say, hey, by the way, somebody called in and said, this is wrong with your stream. Okay, well, thank you, Tony, or whoever, right? So you just have so many different things going on. It's like you're, you're wearing like 10 hats. And then you're also trying to make sure that what you're saying on air isn't going to offend anybody, right? Whether if it's the audience, a certain group, or the people that you work for, awesome. right? There goes our there there goes our spot to Mike. We will never be able to do a bull TV stream ever. So there's just, right. there's, there's just a lot compiling. There's a lot compiling when you're when you're doing this gig. And um, you know, if, what happens if you wake up and you just don't feel good? And and let's say you're having a bad day or you get some bad news. You get a call from home that your printer doesn't work in your apparel business, and now you're gonna have a bunch of customers emailing you about where's my shirts, right? Um, all that stuff starts to weigh on you and compound on you because I take on so much. But I do want to say for a second that the guys that are out there, one thing that has kind of pissed me off throughout this whole Mike's not there thing is it's kind of been unfair to the guys that are working out there um, mm -hmm. because they are my boys. OK, Chase Kaufman, Brian Kane, uh, Craig Elliott, Tom Hess, uh, Curtis Von Kruger, Patrick Martinez and of course, JT. They're all my homies. They're all my buddies. They've all done something for me at one time or another, uh, you know, not on air that they're my friends. They actually genuinely care about me. Emil Williams Jr. as well. Um, and, you know, the Ben Davis thing, okay, uh, you know, I'm going to say something here and I might get in trouble for it, but when a guy like Ben Davis gets sent over on whether or not well, should he be included with Bull TV, you know, Jason Thomas sent me a mess, an email with a demo reel for this guy and everything. It says, Mike, I want your opinion. Do you think this guy – would be worth it for bowling. Like, do you think we should possibly bring this guy on? And I've watched his demo reel and I'm like, holy cow, this guy comes from MMA, it reminded me like WWE or something too. And I was like, man, if we could get this guy in bowling, put him with somebody knowledgeable about bowling, he could bring a lot of energy. I don't know if he could do it for 12 hours a day. Okay. That's impossible. But I like Ben. And many people don't know that we brought Ben to Ron Moore's event, the senior shootouts in Vegas. And he worked alongside with me and I was teaching him how to keep score. I had him with one of those printouts where he was writing down the scores and keeping score and he would compare it to the South Point scoreboards. And after a couple of games, he was able to keep score. Then I let him do, because uh, I was the lead on the, on, on the ground there, I let him do two or three step ladders. I think it was two step ladders with Tom Hess. And I thought he did an amazing job for never calling bowling. Like I thought he did a really good job and he developed this, this love affair with Bo Gergen. Like he just fell in love with Bo Gergen, Bo Gergen, where's Bo Gergen? And, you know, he had that kind of nutty, kind of not so professional, but fun. And, and I'm like, man, this guy is going to be great. And then when I didn't work the masters and he goes in there and, you know, they put him with, with, um, with the other Ben, Ben Glasscock, who's another great guy, but those two guys together, I think everybody would have thought, man, they, they should be with somebody that knows a little more bowling than putting those two together for a squad. And they just got completely hammered. Like, I mean, not hammered because they were drinking, but hammered on the internet. And I didn't think it was fair because those guys all actually work long days. Those guys, I think Ben Davis, if he's around long enough, he, he could be very good for bowling. You just got to put him with, with the right person. But I will tell you, these guys getting completely blasted because I wasn't there. I did feel kind of bad about that because they are great people. And I do think that they do do a good job. Yeah, but it's not you. it's not about whether they're great people. It's about whether they're they're you know fully suited to fill the role that they're being asked to fill. You know, so uh, yeah, I mean, you, you it's it's tough. It's a tough position to be in. I'll say because you got to know bowling. You you, you kind of have to know your stuff to to do that. Like like you kind of have to know it inside and out too. You can't know it a little bit. You got to really know it. You know, and you really know it. And that that's that's why I think a lot of people enjoyed, um, you know, you you doing the commentary because it was somebody who really understood the game at a, at a very high level and understood Whoa. the nuances and understood the things that the that the fans that are tuning in who are mostly hardcore bowling fans themselves notice and take note of, etc. Go ahead, Rob. I'm sorry. No, Mike. Look, Flanagan was a bowler, man. I mean, no we doubt. both juniors against each other. 
I mean, Mike, and, you know, that's why Tom Hess is good at what he does, right? Like, because yeah. he's a bowler, he knows bowling. Uh, so, to like, even you're seeing it on the broadcast, like even this week with Fanta, like Fanta is a professional broadcaster, but he has some moments where you're like, if he was a bowler bowler, he probably wouldn't have said what he said, right? And I think that's the hardest thing. And I think like Rob Stone on top of that is another one who he wasn't a bowler. Like he's he's learning still the bowling part of it. Um, and that's why like Randy has done what he's done for so long because he understands bowling and then he kind of put it together with the entertainment part. So, I mean, yes, I think it was a mistake. I think the timing of it was bad with them putting – Ben Davis and Glasscock on the like day you were like people were starting to ask where you were. And then on top of that, they're making basic mistakes like calling Parker Bones son by the wrong last name, whose last name is synonymous with the all time greats. Like you make mistakes like that and people are going to light you up on the Internet. There is no mercy on the Internet and people our emails and our text messages and phones i mean it was lighting up it was like christmas i remember being at the gym and being like what the hell is going on all of a sudden it's like put on bowl tv put on bowl tv you gotta watch you worst of the week worst of the year worst of the decade i'm like holy crap what are they doing over there yeah i mean you know i've mispronounced names as well i understand bond versus bone and all i i, I but he got him he got him I, I had i had dinner with a couple of folks that came through st louis that worked for a bowling company and that was the first thing they wanted to talk to me about is really Bond versus – and I'm like, all right. I spelled my name wrong on a graphic before. Like, I mean, everybody makes mistakes, but I understand. I understand where everybody was coming from. Well, these are bowling. These are diehards. If you're – if like, I know. These are, you know the Bull TV chat. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I love that. I love being on there because it's like people, they are so serious. And it's – you know, and you – Man, you say a name like that. Could you imagine if a UFC went down and they pronounced Chuck Liddell's name wrong? Lyle. Or like it yeah. would be a massacre. Like they would choke the guy out literally on TV. Uh, who was who was calling that on UFC? And I'm just saying that's kind of what it was like. But uh, I just want you to know what was going on on a fan's perspective when all this was going down. I can't imagine what your phone was going down, Mike. When people reaching out to you, going, "Where the hell are you? You need to like." The bat signal was going up for Flanagan for like a minute, I think. All right. I, I wanna I wanna talk to Rob for a second, Mike. And and if you want to respond, you can. Yeah. But sure. I'm but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk to Rob. Yeah. Uh, uh -oh. I Rob, I want to highlight this comment. Okay. Uh Sean okay. in the chat. What's up, Sean? Says, I miss your interactions with the chat. I have commented multiple times in the last two weeks. Crickets. The chat just ain't fun anymore. Okay. Another person made the same point. Uh, somebody else in the chat uh, brought up the Pete Weber interview, okay? And, you know, like, Rob, if there's two main things, first of all, his exit was abrupt, okay? I'm going to say that. And number two, if there's two main things that I've noticed about Bowl TV that have changed dramatically since Flanagan left, it's number one, they are not interacting with the chat anymore. And number two, they are not really bringing guests in the booth. Okay. Mm. So, you know, listen, I'm just, I'm just making my own observations as a fan. Okay. That's one of the things I enjoyed about watching bowl TV. I enjoyed the interviews. I thought that Pete Weber interview was like, that's the reason you subscribe to bowl TV. That's the reward you get for tuning in and watching for various hours is that at some point they bring in a legend and you know what, maybe he says some things that people aren't so okay with or, or don't agree with, but he's Pete Weber. He can say what he wants. Okay. So it doesn't really matter what you think and the fans enjoy it, you know, and in terms of the game, it's not bad to have a controversial conversation every once in a while. Okay. So those are two of the big things that I noticed a a after Mike's departure you know, uh, I have something, Mike. Seemed, that I noticed. seemed very, seemed very Chad-like to me. I'm gonna Ooh. say. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that. Go ahead, Rob. So the one other thing that I noticed too is, look, like 12 hours to fill to time fill is a lot of time, right? It's, I mean, it's crazy how much. Like I, I did it for a couple hours at the Agent Ong Open where I streamed, and 
you literally have to like you can't talk all action of what's going on in the lanes like there's got to be side chat mike there's got to be like even if it's like hey like uh, yo i ate at this fire pizza place for lunch right if it's just even engaging outside of bowling talk right me and you do that all the time how many times have i talked about like me fighting with my dog or my uh in the dog park with people right just like personal shit right i noticed when mike left there has only been on the lane calls right there isn't a lot of side chatter going on there isn't a lot of like uh you know interesting kind of like side banter right where me and you will talk about bowling but we'll also talk about some of the craziness that happens to us outside the bowling center so i think that's the other thing too that has kind of stopped when mike left and yeah like i mean we need we need some of that back but i mean mike's doesn't sound like he's coming back anytime soon so uh we're kind of stuck with what we got i guess rob mike as bowlers who came up in the game right and spent hours upon hours in bowling alleys as kids where did we hang out a lot of the time where did you Wait. spend a lot of those hours inside the bowling alley when you weren't bowling oh the pro the shop game, game room or the pro shop the pro <laughs> shop okay the pro shop and you know what when you were in the pro shop you often talked about bowling and the subject was often focused on bowling but some of the funniest and best conversations the most memorable conversations that i had in the pro shop didn't even involve bowling. Okay. It wasn't even about bowling. And you know, that was, that was kind of the vibe that I felt Mike was bringing to bowl TV, sort of like a, a pro shopish type vibe. Like if you were hanging in the pro shop, watching bowl TV, this is who, this is who you would want. You know, you know, Mike would be a good guy to have come walk in the shop and sit there for 12 hours and watch it with you. But you know, uh, you know, I've noticed these changes. So, all right, we'll leave it at that. Mike, anything anything you want to respond to, add, you know, retort, et cetera, based from what well, we said? it's all subjective, right? Like, just because you guys like it doesn't mean that most of the audience likes that inside stuff, okay? It's all subjective. The three of us, if we took a personality test when it comes to bowling, we would all probably be in the same quadrant, right? We'd all be hanging out in the same area. So it's easy for you guys to say, I like what you were doing, right? But, you know, they had some stats, like very small amount of the subscribers even chat in general, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's many of them that just sit there and, and listen to the thing. So if, if we're on some sort of tangent about how to save some money on your car insurance by switching your deductible to 0%, you know, which I did do on the air multiple times, and I actually had some people come up and thank me and say, thank you so much. I hit a deer, Mike, and boy, was that a great $31 I spent every year. But, you know, I would just always come up with weird stuff, right? Well... If you if you're trying to take your network to the next level, I could understand uh, that you're going to move in more of a direction of professionalism and not talking about, you know, weird, weird stuff. But I always kind of enjoyed nitwittery is what I call it. Right. There's a there's a morning show in St. Louis has been on the air for, I think, 20 years now. It's called The Morning After. And it's it's got a cult following of people that watch this show and listen to this podcast show or whatever. And they, they are so off the rails. It's a sports talk show, but they don't even talk about sports anymore. They talk about anything and everything. And they get these sponsors, and the sponsors get return on their investment because they do the support the sponsor thing. And they have more, they, it's a very, very, very uh, well maintained show that has a very great ecosystem sponsorship wise. And the guy that runs the show, his name's Tim McKernan. And he always talks about how he's the greatest and he never makes a mistake and he's awesome and no, and his dad's amazing and all these different sorts of things. And the whole show, the inside joke is this guy calls himself the greatest, but it's an inside joke, right? And I, I kind of sort of took parts of these things that influenced me, Dan Patrick, Bob Costas, Ben Scully, and this stupid morning show in St. Louis that I've loved forever and I try to incorporate it into what I do throughout a 16 hour day of live streaming or whatever it is. And when I say I'm the best, I've never made a mistake. I'm the greatest. I, I'll raise my voice kind of like this, guys. Hey, let's go over here and take a look at lanes five and six. Oh, look, there's two 300 games about to happen. Just this goofy, crazy stuff. A lot of that stuff is taken from my influences, like the morning after in St. Louis. And Kevin, who's always in your chat, Kevin A. Bear, he, um, he watches that show religiously too. And he's around my age. And he even texted me before the show tonight and said, can you get in a TMA reference tonight on the show? And they do this thing called free dotum where they started yelling at professional golf tournaments, you know, just like Baba Booey. 
And, you know, every once in a while in the chat, I'll see somebody type free dotum on Bull TV. And I have to text Tim McKernan and say, hey, Tim, you even got free dotum in the Bull TV chat. And I print all their merch for their morning show. So it all kind of comes full circle. I've got these influence and these successful things that I follow and I'm around. And I try to bring some of that into bowling. You know, I saw a couple of a couple of notes here in the and comments in your chat here that were kind of making me laugh. First of all, Lucas Wiseman is giving you the hardest time in the world, Mike. That microphone needs to be closer to your mouth. It's it's yeah, like no. on on another planet. No, because then no, you start no. hearing it breathe. Yeah, and it's too loud. It's too loud. <laughs> yeah, I have to manage it. Okay. Uh, every, you know, that, that's one of our inside jokes around here is my headset and my microphone. Yeah, he's like a helicopter you know, pilot. I've I got I got a comment. Everybody hates it, but I've stuck with it. Yo, let me tell you something, okay? I, there is no comparison between me and Flanagan, okay? Flanagan is uh, uh, essentially, I mean, you could call a professional, like, streamer, like, in all sense of it, right? Digital content creator, streamer. Me, I do this shit once a week, maybe twice a week. I work a full-time job. I, I've been kind of improv this for five years. So, you know, this is definitely no comparison. Mike is definitely on another level of this than I, I am. And I was just saying I had a personal experience sitting in the booth. So I got a little bit of a taste of what Mike was doing 12 hours a day for, for months straight. Yeah, well, it, 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 here's the thing. I learned this a long time ago. If you do a thousand hours of anything, you get pretty good at it. So if all of a sudden I went and played tennis for a thousand hours and said, Hey, you guys want to play some tennis? I'd probably kick your ass, right? Because I put a thousand hours into it. I put a lot of time into streaming. I can't even think about going back and listening to myself in 2011, call on bowling. It's like nails on a chalkboard, you know, it, Oh my God, I don't want to listen to that at all. The other comment though, before I forget about it is there was a young lady in your chat here okay. that brought up that, that she was bowling women's nationals and she was taught. Yeah, that, that's it. Dawn here. She was, she was, in, I remember this specifically. She was talking about bowling in an event and the people in the chat were like giving her the hardest time. And I'm like, hold on a second, everybody. She's getting ready to bowl women's nationals and has a legit question or comment here. Give her a break. And I guess that, 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 that resonates with her that she still remembers me uh, sticking up, you know, and, and you talk about, people, Mike. You, you said something about the guests, Mike. Um, you said something about having guests in the yep. booth. I always tried to have an open booth policy. Um, you know, for whatever reason there for the longest time, uh, the prior commentator crew or people in charge of, of live streaming, whether it be extra frame or flow bowling, got into the habit of putting their broadcast booth in a closet somewhere way off the beaten path. And they couldn't even see the bowling. They were just watching the monitor. And I, I said, I don't want to do this. I, we can't see, breathe, touch what's going on. And I want to have a microphone at the end where the bowlers come up and, and grab it and just start talking if they wanted to. Like DJ Archer at the U.S. Open had the microphone was down there. And they're not supposed to be able, they're not under, supposed to be on their phones, do anything. And DJ, they were so hard, right? Because they're bowling on the same bay and, you know. And, and, and he just picked up the microphone and started talking to me. I couldn't talk back to him because that's like a, it's a, against the rules. But he, he just started talking to me as if he was having a conversation with me about, Mike, they are so hard right now. It's like the Masters at Augusta. And, and you know, that little stuff, these player relationships with these guys being able to do that. If any players are listening to this right now, and if you had a relationship with me and you pick up a microphone, and you don't feel like you have a relationship with the guys that are already in the booth, you should start, you should keep doing that. Even if I'm not there, um, because that's what the fans want. I can't tell you how many times somebody would come over like a Jason couch or a Mike Albee or whoever it may be. And they're just hanging out by the booth. And I would take my headset off, turn down the microphone and say, have a seat. And then I'd look at my teammates and go, you got Jason couch for the next game. And I'm out of there because they don't want to listen to me. They want to listen to Jason Couch. He's a Hall of Famer, and he's going to give you way more than I possibly can. I got plenty of hours on the air this week. I'm good. So that's 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 what I have to say about what you were saying with that. All right, no doubt. Have we have we discussed the milk carton of Mike Flanagan <laughs> enough tonight? Should we move on? We should. The hashtag Free Flanagan is going to trend after this. I don't know what that means, but it's kind of funny. Okay. <laughs> and I and I should say, you know, somebody said here, Mike, what are your businesses? Okay, I haven't heard you plug them. And I keep that. I don't really promote my businesses, but I still live stream bowling tournaments on YouTube on Inside Bowling. 
and we're still trying to get to 100,000 subscribers. We're at like 86,000. We put out instructional content, and I'm actually doing bowling ball review videos. So make sure you subscribe to Inside Bowling on YouTube. That's one Ooh. thing that we do. Ball review videos, patch, patch piracy. Are you, oh, are you yeah. involved in patch piracy? You are. Brun oh, Brunswick man. and Motive have been very good to me. They send me one of every release, and I've done a terrible, terrible job of actually getting out there and, and putting these videos. Look at Mike's together. reaction. Okay. Look at Mike's reaction. <laughs> Dude, every time someone gets free stuff and Mike does it, he gives. He, my, he can't, he I'm gonna can't. drop my address after the show, so you know. I'm a pro shop owner now, though, Mike. Feel so. free. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you can get all your favorite goods at Inside Bowling if you don't have oh, a pro shop. You're already seeing one them. one patch pirate to another. Flanagan, my brother Jeff, who's the the king, I think, of the patch pirates. He's coming in. Uh, Lucky I even I, let I you love come on here knowing that now. <laughs> I, lo I love Jeff. I love Jeff. Um, All right, Mike, you ready to talk about some bowling, some TV bowling? Because let's do yeah. it. So, so where do you want to start? You want to start because the World Championship show is set. Yeah, we'll talk. You want to run that down real quick? No, because no? We'll, we'll we'll set up a nice little review after at the end for the World Championship. Okay. The nine man right. step ladder, at least better than eighteen men step ladder, I guess. At okay. least they cut it in half. I mean, the nine. I love to see what the odds of the nine seed to win. Uh, which I think is like Mike Martell, who got and sneaked in over Belmo with the last game. Anyway, let's talk Sheeta uh, because we had a first time winner, Mike, uh, 20 year old, came close to beating the Norm Duke age by a couple years. I don't think that record's ever going to be broke, to be honest with you. Uh, Big Mike, where do you want to start with that deal, Bernard show of him uh, making it look easy, uh, looking very uninterested in bowling? While he was bowling, I mean, just completely robot, like just did his business, struck a lot and won. So where do you want to start, Big Mike? Well, I want to start by telling everybody that I had Dio Bernard to win, baby. Oh, there Come you on. go. I know. There you I had go. Dio Bernard back. to win at like plus 550, okay? I got a beef well, with Bet Rivers, by the way, Mike. Bet and... Rivers wouldn't let me put my bet in. And I ha I work on an Indian reservation. So in order for me to, to bet before I get, I have to bet before I have to do it in the morning before I leave for work. So I put the bet in and I went to work and the bet never went through, I guess. By the time I got home, the show already started from work. And I'm like, oh, probably Bernard ain't going to win anyway because I put money on him. And of course he wins. So bet Rivers, you owe me a bunch of money because the bet never went through and I should have won. But um all right, let's start with this show, so I had, Mike. Me... I had Dio Bernard at plus 550, hit that. And then in game one, I took uh, – game one, if you remember, was B.J. Moore against Keplinger. And like a stone I eight took, match. I know. I took B.J. Moore and the over in that game. And, yeah, I did not win because of the stone eights. So that was uh, I'm gonna... that was the difference there. I'm going to throw this to Flanagan. Um so let's – I don't want to go match to match or else we're going to be here all night. Um, I think we should just talk the show in general. Okay. Uh, I'm going to bring it to Flanagan. What were your thoughts on this show? Uh, what, did, what did you leave the show thinking and feeling uh, and uh, any, like, perspective from, from from your end? I just thought the scoring pace for that event out of the get-go was just extremely high, right? And, you know, they said it on the show the other night that, you know, EJ's probably going to beat Belmo's all-time – average for a season so that's pretty crazy uh so seeing the people that made the show whenever it's a score fest you get different faces sometimes that can happen and that's what i saw from it this mikey schlaubach guy i watched him bowl the rpi i was out there calling that action and i called him uh like a mini ej tackett i mean he's a bigger version of course because he's taller but if you really watch him bowl he really throws it like ej they're both on motive staff um and both from indiana i believe so I don't think that's the last we're going to see of him. Uh, and then Alec Keplinger, obviously Sandra Joe Shirey's son. Um, that guy, I, I know Barnes has backed him in the past. And when I hear of a guy like Barnes backing a bowler, uh, I think, wow, this guy's got some talent, right? So I thought that was really cool to see him do that. Kind of reminds me when Marshall Kent made his first show at the World Series of Bowling way back the year that Parker Bone won the World Championship, I believe was when Marshall made his first show finished second because of a 7-10 on the right lane with a defiant soul. He was using a different ball on each lane. Uh, but I thought Dio Bernard, I, all I think about is when I was his age, 20 years old, where was I at in my life? And what if I would have won a PBA title? 
well, how would that feel, Rob? I'm sure you could put yourself in those shoes. If you're going to Saginaw and, you know, all of a sudden you bowl this event and you win, right? The groupies, the bowling oh. groupies. Yeah, I'd be hanging out in every bowling bar I could find on my way home. And his dad being there, you know, the Bones and the Barnes get all this dad-son notoriety. Well, we got some father-son stuff going on here. Of course, the McCunes as well. I can't leave them out. But I thought it was cool. And I, I think Dio's a good kid. All my interactions with that kid has just been very humbling and just very nice. So mm, kudos right. to him. And uh, I think Cheetah, Cheetah Championship is one where – you kind of get some first-time winners over the years. I yeah, had a note game. here. I took notes. I took notes on everything because that's the way I watch the shows. And uh, just two notes I want to share with the people. Um, Dio is Freddie for the Cheddar. I'm announcing it. The kid is Freddie for the Cheddar. He's 20 years old. He's that cool, calm, and composed on the show. Sick, sick performance for, for a kid. And then as soon as I wrote that note, as soon as I wrote that note, he went big four. (laughs) He went big four. I'm not even kidding. People are going to hate my take on this, and I'm going to get a ton of heat for what I'm going to say here. Oh, God, I know what you're going to say. So a few things, okay? Uh, They're bowling on one of the highest scoring patterns of the year. Dio had the whole left to himself, okay? If you don't think – if anyone out there doesn't think that was an advantage for him – extreme advantage for him the kid had room to miss left room to miss right he was using a urethane right he didn't have a lot of change to deal with so it's a lot it's easy to be freddy for the cheddar when you have a lot of room in a lot of area and not a lot of transition to deal with okay so that's my first right i'm not taking credit away from dio like he, he bowled it he earned it but it, it it seemed like it was just a little bit too easy in a sense, right? Um, so that's my first take, okay? The second is um, if I was 20 and I was on the show, I'd, man, it would, the, the craziness, Flanagan, you knew me very well when I was younger, so a big mic, the craziness that would have been going on with me winning these matches, steamrolling people, whatever it was, like it would have been must-see TV. I would have been out of my mind crazy, like, you know, God only knows I might have been riding the ball return, like Happy Gilmore riding the bull. Like, who who knows at this point? Um, I, I just wouldn't want to see more emotion. Uh, like, I, I just won't want to see more, like, looking like he wanted to be there. Like, he just looked so uninterested, like a teenager that was forced to, like, mow the lawn. Like, he just didn't look like he wanted to be there. Now, I know that's not the case, but from a fan's perspective, I wanted to see just him be a little bit more, like, emotional now we'll, we'll, we'll get to the next night which was an amazing night i love that night the other part of his was i want to talk about uh, Sh- uh schleibach uh I, I think i want to nickname happy to be there okay because that's I what he looked that like he looked like he was happy to be there right i wanted to see more like i want to win I want, i'm here to win he looked like he was just happy to be there now that's from a fan's perspective i don't know the kid but i wanted him to show a little bit more like F you, I'm running over you. This is my show to win. Instead, he just kind of was happy, laughing, just kind of played it off like he was just, you know, like, oh, this is great. I'm I'm, I'm just going to, like, lose and, you know, wave to the fans and leave. So, I don't know. That was my really perspective. And then the BJ Moore eight pins. That was just nasty. I felt so bad for BJ. Ugh, just complete nastiness. Should have actually, should have won. And I, I bet I think BJ would have went a little bit further in that in that in that ladder. So yeah, I had another note. Yeah. Dio looks unstoppable against Slaybach, who seemed to just be there to enjoy the moment. And then the final note I want to share: no one brought this up. Marshall Kent flagged the head pin left on a show again. Can we talk about this? Uh, he seemed to he seemed to allude to it being move based. I mean, he could have been trying to play a different part of the lane, I guess you could say. But that's, you know, why Why would you think that the ball is going to hold that way, throwing it there on Cheetah? I, I, I wouldn't imagine, right? I, I, I don't know. To me, it kind of looked like a uh, it looked like a poorly executed shot. He was trying to get the ball right deep down the lane the whole time. He didn't get anywhere near deep down right where he was trying to get it, break point wise, and run away, run away, one, three, six. I mean, any comment on that? I, I got one for you. So, uh, you know, B- 
Bill O'Neill talks about when he bowls on television, he tries to keep his angles as straight as possible. Norm Duke also tried to do the same thing. And Chris Barnes was the, the first guy to really be noticeable trying to keep your angles a lot straighter on television. Then Fagan retooled his game to do the same thing. Marshall Kent has yet to buy into that. And at times he looks completely like, who is this guy? How can this guy possibly be made the TV show with these couple of weird adjustments that he makes on TV? I think Marshall would maybe have maybe two or three more wins if his strategy on TV was more like Bill O'Neill, Fagan, and Barnes. Mm. Mm. We also had some some daps between the players on this show. Three bet one, what's good? Uh, I was not I was not a fan either. Three bet one, I could do without the I could do without the hand slaps from the from the players in between. Kyle Stark in the chat, you're gonna, you're going to get worst of the week, bro. He says you act like you never cut it short on a short pattern. Am I a professional, bro? Am I a professional? Like I cut it short on a short pattern every week, bro. Dude, I've every week, and I come times. on a podcast and talk about it. I'm a hack. What else do you want to know? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about professionals. That's like asking asking a sports commentator who 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 says uh, Tom Brady threw a bad pass. If he throws a bad pass, no, no, it doesn't work that way. All right, Dude, people sorry, give a bit too about look about Dio's personality. I get it, right? I get the kid's very humble. He's very reserved. Doesn't show a lot of emotion. And I also understand that's a lot of keys to success on TV, where you have to keep your emotions in check. I get it. You, you see a lot of the players in the career, the history of bowling, had zero emotion got up there, did the job. They won their titles, right? Guys like Walter Ray, right, who would show emotion every once in a while. He did, but he would be able to keep his emotions in check. Scroggins, right? I mean, guys like – but, look, I'm just coming at it as a fan from an entertainment purpose, and I just wanted to, to see a little bit more, like, oomph out of him. But, thankfully, thankfully, we have Kevin Williams and Packy to thank for an amazing match they had the next night. So, Mike – Big Mike, that's my transition. Hey, Rob, Rob, real quick, just something to think sure. about with these, with these players with mm -hmm. uh, with showing emotion, like you in the mm -hmm. front row cheering for Bill with the plaid shirt on, World Series of Bowling. I get all that, but the, these guys, these these guys also, it's almost like they just got their first big corporate job and they're going into their first board meeting. So if they go into their first board meeting, the, the last thing they want to do is make any of the brass in there, or the seasoned veterans pissed off at them, right? right? And now that now that we have this PBA league, okay, Andrew Anderson ran out a shot at at, at Woodland Bowl at at the World Championship. I think I don't remember the event, and he didn't get picked in the PBA league. And one of the reasons was Andrew Anderson lacked respect for the other players because he ran it out. If Dio Bernard wants to be in the PBA league, and if he's riding the ball return like a horse or a bull against his opponent, I don't think Norm Duke's going to pick him for the Dallas Strikers. Just something else to keep in mind. Hey, I get this politics, right? And I get, and look, anybody knows corporate America, it's me and how to act professional. Because guess what? Like, I have to be like that at my job. I'm not going around cursing and yelling and whatever. Um, I just want to see the young. I want to see some future young like talent that is not afraid to like get 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 it. You know what I mean? Um, and I still think, and me and Mike talked about this off air a couple days ago. Anthony Simonson is the future of the PBA, in my opinion. He is the best. The kid doesn't care what he's. He flips off people. He's not afraid to be emotional. He's the most talented PBA player, and he's about what, like twenty six. 27 and he's to the point where trust me he's getting drafted in the league so um you know i just want to see a little bit more emotions out of the young kids i want to show or hope that there's a little bit of pete weber in some of these kids right like i do too it's just it's just probably not going to happen with many of them coming out of collegiate ranks and at the college ranks they're teaching them to be even keeled every shot's just like the next one you know so anyway i was gonna say it like I it's it. such a bad take because it's it, it goes against what they need to do to win, and he knows that. <laughs> and he knows that. That's why it's, such a, just why it's, it it's such a disingenuous take because it's like saying, "Well, I want them to act in a way that's detrimental to them <laughs> accomplishing the goal they want to accomplish." Like, 
what are you talking about? Like, if you would have made a PBA show, Rob, not only would they have wanted to shank you, okay? Like, somebody would have came up with to you with a with a with a ball carver, okay, or one of those tape insert knives, right? And they would have right. went, gah, 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 and like Guess just what? ganked you. But people but would have loved me. People would have hate me. But people would watch. No, but okay? you also, we all know that quote. One one shot would have been. 10 miles an hour slower than the next one. It would have been a bull 120. Watch out crossover. Out like, of bull 120. You would have been so amped up. You would have been so amped but up. That was like, the beauty of P. Weber, Mike, in his prime. P. Weber was able to do that and still win. And there's okay? not many that can. There's not there many that can. At that's that what level, I'm saying. You know? I know I said it's a crazy take, and I know people are going to get on me, whatever the chat and all them. You know, it is. I don't care because I'm still looking at it as a as a an entertainment point of it. But we we the PBA showed what it could do on a Packy Kevin Williams match the next match. Okay, that's what I want to see every match. Right, I want to see great bowling, but I want to see them like going at each other a little bit, showing some emotion, getting the crowd involved. That crowd was dead, Mike. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it was that I and they were trying to do whatever they could to get the crowd amped up, and you know it just they were struggling to do that. But man, what a match! Let's transition to Scorpion, okay? Because I could talk God. about um, this was the Belmo versus the Lefty show, Mike. Yeah, that um, was that was over quick. That was over quick. Uh, and I'm gonna you know throw us to Flanagan. Flanagan, what were your thoughts on this show? All two hander show. Four lefty two-handers, one obviously Belmo two-hander. Uh, Flanagan, what were your thoughts here? Uh, like, what do you think overall um, on this one? Yeah, I, I thought, I thought, I, I really, if I was betting it, I would have bet Belmo on this show. I would have just bet him to run right. this ladder, right? And you know, one thing that I was kind of noticing is these guys are thumping holes. Mm. You, did you guys hear in that? You hear Jesper's ball thumping down the lane? I did. Um, I, I I just I don't know. I mean, and I know it happens all the time. But when I when I was bowling back in the day, here I sound like an old man, but I I remember if my hole started thumping, that wasn't good, right? Especially when they get tighter down lane. Um, but I, I heard I heard thumping down the lane. That was something yeah. that really I noticed. Um, the other thing that we haven't brought up yet, and I'll just I'll take this and I'll let you guys talk more about the show in particular. Um, but I, this this right lane every night being a tighter lane down lane, right? I feel like that's a good thing for the integrity of the tournament format. What I mean by that is, if you qualified as a higher seed, you got lane choice. So for you to come on to the show and know that there is one lane that is worse than the other, it actually benefits you to qualify higher. And many, many times that top seed is at a disadvantage, right? So yeah. I think this, this one lane being tougher than the other helps balance out the whole number one seed thing. So that was something I was thinking about during the show. The, the other thing on that show, for me personally, when you know all these guys, it's hard to have a rooting interest, right? It's hard to be a fan of, of the show because you like everybody. And, and the thing I was talking to Kim about when we were watching it is I'm like, well, Belmo is one of the guys that called me, asked me where I was and then he misses me. And, and is there anything he can do for me? Right. And I'm like, well, I want him to win. Jesper opened a case of leaf cards on my YouTube channel. And he's like one of the coolest guys out there. So I wanted him to win. Kevin Williams, I stream his event in Springfield every year. I wanted him to win. I print all of Packy's merch for the house. I wanted him to win. And Matt Russo lives in St. Louis and has been in two videos on my YouTube channel and is the nicest guy in the world. So I was sitting there just like, I, I can't root for anybody, just from a personal perspective, bringing you into my living room. And I was happy to see Russo win. And with Russo's dominance here, reminds me of Tom Doherty's dominance down in florida the covid year mm, that's a good comparison in its uh, own house, i had i had packy to win here just ma mainly based on odds it was plus 325 and i thought give, give me give me a lefty at plus 325 and i'll take that didn't work out for me there uh i put a couple game bets in uh during the show and i, I actually did very well on this show uh first game i had jesper over belmonte 
and under 460 and a half parlayed 20 to win 95 got that at five to one okay because they they had Belmo as the as the favorite there then I I mentioned before I caught Jesper's ball kind of reaction kind of going away and there was a match earlier that leading up to the finals they were in the match play of Scorpion uh Jesper and Kevin Williams bowled each other and it looked like whatever Kevin Williams was doing with the resin that he was using was not making Jesper's look very good throughout the match. Okay. And and Williams beat Jesper in that match. So uh I took I took Kevin Williams three different ways. I took him straight, I took him plus the pins, because they he was the dog, and I took Williams went to win parlayed with the under 445, which just hit. Because Jesper went to the uh, went to the uh, uh, resin ball at the end. Can we of the talk game? about that, Mike. Like, yeah, because I've been man. I've been yeah, chomping I, I've been chomping to talk about this match. Um, I found it very uh, interesting that Randy and Fanta were both talking about how uh, Jesper was been has been labeled a one trick pony, and people have been giving him criticism in regards to only being able to succeed with urethane. And um, I found it interesting that while they were talking about that, it was very obvious from any bowler who knows ball reactions and knows just what to look at that Jesper needed to switch out of that urethane. And I get if the match was close. I get if it was within 10, 15 pins. But as soon as uh, Kevin's threw that triple in the middle of the match, or you know, I think he threw four in a row at one time during the middle of the match, and Jesper was still flat sevening, I think Jesper needed to get out of that urethane three to four frames quicker, right? And this is the continue. We see this from Jesper on a lot of different shows, especially when there's a lot of lefties on the show and there's more transition. Uh, Jesper just seems to be like jail, like in jail with his urethane, and he's just not quick enough yet to get out of it, to move to urethane, uh, to, to move to performance. And I think once Jesper picks that up quicker and realizes, hey, my urethane isn't isn't right, I need to get to performance, he'll start winning more on TV. But he need that if he doesn't get out and he still continues to want to use that urethane and try to jam it in, he's not going to beat Russo and Packy and Kevin on these lefty shows. It's just not going to happen when you're throwing performance standing about an hour right at him. Especially with the new your thing. I mean, I think I think that's clear too, right? And 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 Rob, let, you know, and Mike, let me say something. If I knew what was going to happen, shouldn't he have known what's going to happen? Shouldn't his ball reps have known what's going to happen? I mean, I'm a hack sitting at home watching. Who I'm a hack who watches a lot of bowling, okay? And I knew, I was I was ultra confident that Kevin Williams is going to win this game because the your thing look is going away. And Jesper's not going to get out of it. And Williams is going to throw resin. It's going to get continue to get progressively worse as the game goes on. And that's exactly what happened until he he, he was basically forced to throw throw the throw the uh, the resin. It's a good point, Costas. That's why Deron's strategy was so brilliant. Um, it, Blake wants to know if that's a ball rep thing. Uh, I, I'd like to throw that to Flanagan and see what your no, thoughts on can't that. Can't be. Can't be. Look, I will say this. All right. And I, and I am not, I am not a numbers guy. I am not a pro shop guy. I've never gotten into the drilling of bowling balls and I've never gotten into the really real technical side of these balls. But a long time ago, you know, I used to soak up this knowledge when uh, the um, hot spot or the triangle on the Nighthawk, which is the uh, mass bias location on the ball was the Nighthawk. And I was told if you put if you if you put it at a 1030 with the with the with the mass bias to the right of your thumb, it created this this mid lane. If you stacked it up and down in a 12 o'clock position, uh, that was the, the back end. And then if you put it at 130, like a label drill, that was called the arc. Right. And your bowling ball would give 33 percent of the energy in all three parts of the lane and these different things. And I know we have advanced so far beyond that. And that is so old school. Right. But I also know that if you put your pin closer to your positive axis point, that it pretty much tames down the ball reaction. And there's also a such thing as drilling the differential out of a bowling ball, okay, which kind of deadens and kills the ball, okay? So the thing for me is with this IQ78, 
ball is Storm also has an IQ tour, which is a very calm, reacting, reactive bowling ball. And then you can adjust the surface, which is, I believe, 80% of the reaction of the ball. They always say it's the tires, right, on the car. I just wonder, and I don't know if this has been tried or not. I'm sure it probably has. And, and look, this would be like a ball rep saying, Flanagan, here's how you should stream a bowling tournament. So what I'm saying right now could be completely talking out of my ass. But that's, what I, that's what I do every but, week. But I would try everything under the sun possible for a guy like Jesper or a guy like Buttriff to, to move these positive access points. I believe that does help deaden a bowling ball to where you could go from an IQ 78 and then go into an IQ tour. Maybe it's some other ball. Maybe it's a, a tropical something or it's a hustle or something like that, some lower end ball. And, and I do believe there's got to be a ball, ball progression there. And if they haven't figured it out yet, they've got the minds within each one of these ball companies to bring them into their test facility, try to replicate some of these patterns and I'm sure the players and the ball companies could work this out to where they could practice this and keep working at it. There's got to be some sort of physical thing they can do with these bowling balls to help these guys out when they're on television. Because I said a little while ago on this podcast that the straighter is greater on television. You guys are ripping on Marshall for what he was doing. And we talked about Bill and we talked about Barnes and Fagan and these guys going straighter. So Jesper, it's smarter to stay straight. Doesn't need to be open up the lane and hooking it, but there's got to be something else he could go to, right? So and they just haven't figured it out. Let me ask you, like, why not just, look, I'm with you with the technical side stuff. Right? I worked in a pro shop for a couple of years, right? That doesn't make me an expert by any means. Um, but why not just learn how to, I mean, he knows how to stand right and, 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 and throw it left, like Packy or Kevin. Like, why not just go to some A-SIM, like a big a big ball, and just move right and just feed it into the, like, track like the other guys were doing when that ball goes away? Like, to me, that's the move is get to something strong asymmetrical with some surface, maybe jumping 5 to, like, 10 right, move your eyes, and then just feed it in the, into that spot. Um, and, look, it's easy for us to sit on, on the couch and talk about what you could do during a TV show, right? Like, I get it. It's hard to switch out of a, a urethane mid TV mid match, um, but I think once Jesper figures it out and how to do that, he's going to win. Until that happens, if he's not the only lefty like Dio Bernard was on his side, and he could just feed his urethane um, and not have to deal with any transition, he's going to lose. He's going to lose to Matt Russo and Packy and Kevin and uh, all the other two handed lefties that have been a lot better at throwing performance than he has been and i feel like he deserves the criticism because he's been out there for a very long time and he's been doing this for way longer i believe than even matt and like packy have been doing it so just you know look i'm being hard on jesper but i feel like that's uh uh it's, it's real criticism right and i feel like giving it to him it, it's it's right here in this spot okay uh I had I had one more winning bet on this uh, on the Scorpion My show. Back back I had here. One more winning bet on <laughs> he the Scorpion. He can't show. help himself here. Okay, uh, that's all I want to talk about. Uh, <laughs> and and the, the bet was uh, Packy to win over Williams. Okay, so I bet Williams against Jesper. Then I knew I, I had a you know I had a good strong feeling that Packy was going to out bowl Williams, and I took the over in that game because I thought they're both going to be throwing your thing. They're opening them up a little bit. You know, they're going to be relaxed. They're bowling each other. They know each other well. They're friends. They they room together, et cetera. And, yeah, I was right. So another another 25 into 90 bet there. Uh, so Packy wins that game. He goes on to bowl Russo. And, yeah, Russo, Russo just bowled amazing. I mean, he yeah. just bowled a great game. Packy caught a bad break in that last match with that 7-10. Uh, uh, really, did he, though? He missed right on that shot. He did, but – It was uh, in. I've seen a lot of that in, on that uh, those bay lanes in, in Detroit. You see a decent amount of those flat tens and seven tens. It's always been like that since I remember bowling there, watching those bay lanes. There's something about those lanes that always don't seem like the sevens and tens really want to kick out. Um, I think the scores are always going to be lower there. Uh, I know Randy uh, brought that up too. But look, shouts to Matt Russo, right? Uh, I think Matt Russo is starting to put his – a flag in the ground that he's the best two-handed lefty on tour right now. 
I mean, you know, we'll talk about the world championships, but he's leading right now. He's the number one seed for the world championships on Sunday and Saturday. Um, he's but we turning... talked about it. We talked about it last week when I asked you, like, if yeah, if if you if, top ten bowlers in the world, you got a lefty in there, Mike. Top ten bowlers in the world, you got a lefty in there. We talked about it last week. I said Packy and Russo. would be somebody I would consider. Rob said Russo would be somebody he would consider, and I and I acknowledge that. Uh, thoughts. Russo, Russo doesn't go around Packy yet. I think Packy's still ahead of him. Ooh, um, okay. But I, but I will. I, another couple of observations here is it wasn't too long ago, if you flash back about a decade ago, it was symmetrical bowling balls were winning all the titles, right? Like symmetrical balls. Like you, you saw Belmo with an uproar, with a wrecker. You saw High Roads winning a lot. Um, you saw a lot of symmetrical pieces. Um, and one thing that I've noticed in the last two to three years is a trend is these high end HP high performance bowling balls that pro shops need to sell to be profitable and bowling brands need to sell because they're at a higher price point. They are starting to really become the norm. If you look at this, Kevin Williams was throwing a sensor solid. Okay. Which was tracks HP ball. Then uh, Packy was throwing a Beyond Infinity, right. another another one of those types of balls. And then Russo won with the Cypher, which is also another high, you know. So I find that interesting. And it goes back to your point about Jesper, you know, could he go to a gym or something like that, right? I don't, I don't know if that's how the game's changing, but I don't know if it's with the pattern development or how they have everything going on. But we even seen Belmo use the gym a little bit this year on tour, which would have never been a thing. Uh, in the past, so I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my opinion you. on that. It's just because they keep putting more and more oil on the lane. I do want to say though, the mills, it was the really, mills of oil, Mike. Just, yeah, they just keep going up. It was really nice to see two brand new releases from two different companies. Obviously, Track Buns are the same company, but two different brands being thrown on a title match instead of seeing a pitch black against a purple hammer. OK, uh, I was nice to it felt like the old shows of the late 90s, Mike. Yep. I, I, I would call the pro shop and be like, what was John Mazza throwing? Oh, a synergy pearl. Right. I want that. Like, get me that. Right. Um, today's re today's release day for two of those balls. So it worked out perfect for for the companies. Right. The and Patch Pirates cheer. <laughs> hey, one other thing about Russo, too. OK. You know, when Matt Sanders lost to, to Simonson throwing a backup ball, Sanders hasn't been the same since. Okay. <laughs> he just hasn't. All right. And Matt's my boy. I love Matt. Okay. Uh, but here's the thing I thought the same thing could have happened to Russo when that deal happened with Rash. When Rash called out the integrity thing on TV and Russo basically shit on himself in the 10th frame. Right. Well, Kudos to Russo for overcoming that because I thought that could have been the death of his career. Dude, I love that. The lefty, like, completely Sanders is, like, having nightmares. He's waking up in cold sweats of Andy Simo beating him with a backup ball. Like, literally craziness. Yeah, I was uh, actually – I was at – it was the one bet this week that I was actually happy to lose uh, or okay with losing anyway <laughs> just because – uh, yeah, Matt, Matt Russo was a New Jersey high school bowler. I've known him for a long time. Uh, I practice at, uh, or I've, I've been aware of him for a long time. I should say, uh, I practice at rev rates where, you know, he, he, him and his family are involved in the place there. Uh, I'm often, uh, you know, it's often his dad that I'm booking, booking a lane with. So, uh, I was happy to see him win, you know, even, even though I had Packy in the bet. And as I said, that was a, that was an odds based bet. I actually told I told my uh, my 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 buddy who likes to hammer the betting heavy heavy. I said, "Listen, if you want to hammer this heavy, Russo is the bet to hammer heavy. If you want to bet five hundred or more on on this tournament, take Russo to win the tournament because that's your best bet." Well, but Mike, I told him I bet with the Sunday? odds. We well, talked about that Sunday. We said yeah, Russo we plus one fifty was the bet. We did absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, so shall we move on to uh, well, Shark here, Rob? Which okay. was last night, so it's a lot easier. To, to to have in my memory when you have three shows in a row. Well, you um, gotta take notes like other people do, Rob. No, I hey, look, it's all it's all in here. I remember everything. Um, to me, this show was uh, it was about the right handers and how they were getting their ball um to to hit the spot. Um, and I noticed EJ Tackett was able to get his ball to face up 
when a lot of the right-handers couldn't get their ball to face up the right way. Even Simo couldn't get his ball to face up the right way. Uh, Prather, um, you know, had a little bit of challenges. I think, I don't know why he switched back to his DNA coil. I, I would have liked him to stay with that attention star. Uh, I think he made a bad choice switching balls in his match. Um, but uh, I, I kind of want to throw us to Flanagan. Um, I know I'm kind of all over the place right now on this show, but I don't want to go through match by match. Thoughts, perspectives on this show uh, and EJ Tackett getting his uh, first title of the year. Oh, I was surprised Russo. I know it was a big, you know, it's kind of like that whole you bowl 300 on TV. You got to let down the next game. Mm. Uh, and he won the night, you know, so the night before. So I guess that was expected, but I don't know. I thought he might have just been able to be comfortable and, and get that one. But uh, it's good to see Prather back on TV. Man, that's another one of the good guys out there from being out there week to week. Somebody that would always come by, spend time in the booth, always honor his commitments, you know, whatever. He, I mean, that dude, offer insight, always say hello, goodbye, even when he didn't bowl that. Like, that's just one of the good dudes. So I'm happy to see him back, back, back doing well, at least making a show. Um, Simo, obviously, Simo, EJ, that was great. You know, um, that was a sick match. Yeah, that was such a sick match. That that was like that was like everything you want if you're a bowling fan. I mean, you got two two of the best of, of the day, player of the year last year versus the guy who was second. You know, ne- neither of them have won yet this year. You know, they're if they, I'm, I'm all one in Springfield. Okay, no, you're right. You're right. If they win, they're bowling somebody where you know both of them are going to feel confident that they're that they're going to win that next game. So they both. He won was zero and four against Simon. I didn't know, I know. that. I, I, I heard that record, which was kind of interesting to me. But it all came down to the way the ball was 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 their reaction was. Was to me that was the difference of the match. Simo just couldn't get his ball to face up the pins the right way. Yeah, I mean, if I'm if I'm being truthful, Simo got a couple really good breaks in the beginning of that game to even stay with EJ oh, the early. Pin. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they were you know they were they were they were some good breaks in the beginning of the game, but uh, once he stayed in it, I was severely severely disappointed to see him lose because again. Uh, Betting, betting wise, I had, <laughs> I had, I, I almost picked the finishing order of the entire show on this one. I had Simonson one, Shota two, Tackett three, Prather, Prather four, Russo five for 20 bucks at plus 500. Flanagan, by the way, Big Mike is king of. If he puts a 15 leg parlay, he wins 14 legs. Yeah. If he puts a five leg parlay, he wins four legs. You got a round goes, robin him. You got a round robin those. Oh, shoot, and he goes on record and says, I almost won. I almost won this. I almost won that. Almost in betting, if you I don't do, have I do win a lot, though. I do win a lot. Uh, I had Simon's. So I had that bet with the exact order. And I had Simonson to win as well. Uh, well, let's for, at plus two seventy five. So that was that let's was a talk time. about the text I sent you, Mike. I you s- did. Uh, you you sent me a text before the final and said, uh, "I'm betting everything I have in my account on EJ minus nine and a half." And I said, "You know what? You're right. I feel defeated right now. <laughs> I feel like I just lost out on a big one, but I'm going to ride with you on that horse." And I and- put in a big bet myself. But the funny thing is, to me about that is that as I, I felt like as 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 lost as Shota was on that pair and as poorly as he bowled, EJ still got up in the 10th and needed the first hit for us to win that bet and almost went high and didn't get it. We were fortunate there. Uh, but yes, that was so, a, that was a nice call on your part. I'm glad you I'm glad you texted me and rallied the troops because I, I did. I was going to sit that one out, even I, though I, I was feeling the same thing you were. So I want to talk about why I have put that bet in. Because for me, my opinion is if Simo wasn't getting his ball to face up the right way, then Shota was going to have no chance of getting his ball to face up on that pair. When Tackett, with his rev rate and the way he generates his ball power at the bottom of his swing, it was obvious when he bowled Simo that he had an unbelievable look. And I, I, I'll I, take EJ all day on a long pattern when he could hit up on it and not go through the nose. Uh, and to me, like he... He his reaction doing that motive that pride dynasty. Uh, I mean, how could you bet against him? I thought he was gonna steamroll Shoda. Uh, you know, Shoda, uh, you know, 
couldn't get the ball right. At one time, Timmy, his ball rep, is literally telling him where to stand and where to look. And I, I text Mike. I'm like, shit, Timmy should just be bowling instead of Shota uh, at this point. Shota looked nervous, right? He did. Understandably so. He was nervous. Um, you know, bowling in front of probably a lot of people, watching him from his own country. You know, had a lot on his back, a lot on his plate. EJ at this point has done it, been there. You know, player of the year, major winners, right? All kinds of titles coming off a huge game. To me, there was no doubt in my mind that EJ was going to win. And I thought EJ was going to win by like 30 or 40. I didn't think Shoto was going to bowl over 200. That was just the way I saw the pair looked. And I would have bet more money if I could, if I would have uh, deposited more money in my account. But I didn't. I was, I got a little bit scared there. So I don't know where you want to go with that. But that was my thoughts. Okay. Fine, again, what do you think about that final match? Anything before we move on? Well, Sh Shota is an incredible international talent. I mean, this guy, I've, I watched him in match play at Woodland Bowl one year. Um, I think it was the year Andrew actually got snubbed in the, in the league, as a matter of fact, to make the show. And he, he, Tom Clark told a story how he was standing there with Bill Chrisman, and Bill Chrisman was getting into it. You know, rest in peace, Bill Chrisman. But um, Shota's awesome. And, and I was literally shocked that Shota was throwing it over his toe and could not get the ball right. Um, he just had a, a, a dead case of the tugs. And I don't know his game well enough, but I feel like there was a timing issue. I feel like his, his, his feet were quick, which can happen on television, which causes the arm to come down and tug the ball. And he just, it, he's too good. He's too much of a throw bot from, from Japan <laughs> that 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 can he repeats and something was off and i felt bad for him honestly and when you talk about a lot riding he committed to bowling the entire tour this year he's been over here man i mean i talk about hey being on the road 120 days a year with being able to go home for a weekends or take breaks this guy's been over here man um that was a big night for him and a ton of pressure yep um i am it, it, i am he's free wheeling right like relax uh, like <laughs> just you know free will it essentially so my money's going on the free will relaxed player of the year um who by the way blake ernest in the chat where does this put ej in player of the year talk uh let's talk after world championships because if matt russo wins the world championships he's putting himself directly into the player of the year chat yeah. um and this is going to be a close player of the year i feel like this, this is going to go down to like super like last tournament in my opinion do you guys um, do you guys remember the movie the running man with arnold schwarzenegger where they had the, you sure you remember the movie flanagan you remember the movie i remember the movie. it's been a long time okay i felt watching watching that show last night i felt like showed must have felt like the contestants on the running man <laughs> like that's how that's how he must have felt like you mean like some have, American gladiators yeah like, like I, I i may have fought a little bit in my day uh, I may have, I, you know, I may have been victorious a couple times, but I have a professional killer coming after me right now, <laughs> and you know, it's a tough spot to be in. It it's is. crazy it's player of the year chat right now because you'll have Matt Russo who puts himself in, EJ Tackett who's there. Hey, our boy Bill needs to have a big finish, but he's still in the in the chat. And Rus Russo ain't in yet. If he Russo wins in the number one seat for the world championship. If he wins if, one more match, if, if he wins, if he, he wins does. the world championship, he he might he be the front runner at he that might. point. But you have if Kyle Troop he, if, he, if EJ Tackett wins mm -hmm. the wins the world championship, he may be the front runner at All that right, point. Look, so let's but talk. But I agree, Rob. I think I think we're going to see it come down to the wire. You know, it's going to depend on how this turns out, and yeah, what the players who are in the mix after this set of shows on the weekend. Uh, what they do afterwards. All right, so let's let's give people the the uh, the step ladders. Hey, hey guys, yeah, one, yeah. one other thing about this show. Sorry, but I just want to get it in here. I was watching that show. Did you know that that Prather has kind of got a little different look with his stash? Did you notice? Ooh, did you guys notice that a little bit? St stash is a little different, a little thicker, yeah. a little thicker, and he reminded me of Steve Jaros a little bit, a modern day <laughs> Steve Jaros. And Steve's getting in the mm. Hall of Fame this year. So I just kind of sort of was like paralleling Steve Jaros's career 
and Chris Prather's career and the way that they, the way they bowl and how many boards they cover, I was like, man, this might be Steve Jaros uh, 2.0 here. Well, do people want Flanagan to be a permanent uh, host of Sweep the Racks? This kid's uh, a hater. Think... This kid was hating on us in the chat <laughs> 10 minutes ago. He was hating on us in the chat 10 that's minutes what ago. I love our people because they hate like we hate. So it's yeah. just all, it's a big family of just nonsense debauchery. Yeah, um, I got to go home and fill this. I got to go home and fill your mother's dish. <laughs> hate, 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 hate. Okay. Um, Chappelle show dude, reference, hey, I got you. Maybe Prather keeps that stash if he keeps blowing good. Um, you know, okay. they, they both look like Mr. Flanders. Is what oh, yeah, that's was. what it was. That's what what it Steve Jaros and, and Prather both have that Mr. Flanders kind of look to them. But, Mike, honestly, to compare Prather and Jaros as bowlers, I feel like is – Somewhat disrespectful to uh, praise. Oh, uh, Blake, you're allowed to hate, bro. You're in sweep the rack. That's what we do debauchery and all kinds of craziness here. Off the rails, respectful to pray. Steve Jaros, man, he was the man. Oh, yo, Chris Prather has one of the best games ever. I love his game. I, mean, I, I who does it? That. Like, like you think about the best games ever, it's like Dude. Ozio. Uh, it's Ozio, it's Parker, it's Chris Prather. Okay, he's in that. He's on that list. Okay, he's Norm. on that list. No I put question. Norm in there too. Yeah, you think you think Norm? I don't know. Uh, oh, Weber, dude, that, Weber, definitely. That, you know, but that, that pose like by Steve Norm Jaros, up the Steve Jaros is hey, not guys, on that list. Right, real quick, Jaros. Okay, eight titles all time. Okay, championship round appearances. That's television shows. Nineteen ninety six too, and I'm just going up each year. Five two two three two three five three two two one 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 one, and then of course you know he got older, but he was he made a ton of shows. Okay, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the way they throw it. You know, I mean, hey, Chris Prather, that's like Dude, Doug Kent. Style. That's a good one, Doug Kent. All right, let's do the let's do the step okay. ladder. First off, let's talk about a nine-man step ladder, which oh, is a lot better than the eighteen-man step ladder. But come on, stop with this nonsense! I know, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, okay, uh, Packy first match bowl, Mike Martell. Um, so Mar Martell slips in to knock Belmo out in, in the position round, I believe. Uh, tonight, actually, it happened. Winner bowls Kyle Sherman. Good Who do you like Kyle in that Sherman. first match? Who do you like in that first match? Um, I, like I, I gotta take Packy just based on experience. Yeah. Uh, but Martell is a, is a wild card. You know, I can't go against my guy from Brooklyn. Brooklyn, I mean, no, you that's know, my guy. We grew you know up. He ain't gonna, you know, he ain't gonna go down without a fight. Yeah, uh, he's a lot younger than me, and he used to bowl when he was like a little little kid in Maple Lanes, and he used to just they used to just turn on the lanes because his his mom used to work the front desk, and he used to just bowl as like a little kid. Uh, Mike Martell, so. Hey, hey Mike, if this was if this was like the Super Bowl and you could bet on all kinds of weird stuff, okay? I got a prop bet for you in match number one. Mm. Okay. Zero for a frame. Ooh. For a frame, zero. What do you mean? Who like somebody throws a gutter? No. Like two gutters. Oh, the whole oh. frame? Yeah. Oh no, that's impossible. Shot, shot clock violation. Oh. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I like okay. it. Are, okay. that, that's like it's that's like a safety in the Super Bowl. That's will there big... will there be a shot clock violation? I like that's that. Could like be that. in match number one. Okay. That's a big. That's a big. Uh, there's some big odds on that. Uh, I would imagine. Okay, so the winner of the shot clock match, we'll call it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kyle Kyle Sherman. Sherman. Good to see Kyle Sherman make a world championship show, even though he's the uh, seventh seed and he needs to win like thirty matches to win. Um, winner bowls, Eric Jones. It's good to see Eric Jones make a show. Uh, he's been grinding all year, I, you know, through PTQs. Uh, so that's an interesting, uh, show there from Edmond, Oklahoma. Justin Knowles, we're seeing, we're, we're kind of seeing a trend here at this point. Uh, Kyle Sherman will be the only righty, uh, bowling on the first on the show, first I believe. Show, yeah. mm -hmm. And then, uh, EJ Tackett. Who's going to be? Uh, I don't even know at this point what seed he is. Uh, he's going to uh, be the f the fourth seed, but he'll be bowling in the four or five match on the correct. second show. Yep. Then he bowls Fa, who bowls Jesper, and then bowls Matt Russo. Oof. So this could be a very interesting uh, show for EJ, my opinion. 
I mean, listen, I have I have a future bet on EJ in this tournament to win. Yeah, me too. Back to the betting. Uh, I got to yeah. be honest with you. I feel like I can light that ticket on fire. Um, I don't know. He's got. He's the only righty. So I don't think there's any way. On the he's last running show. a ladder against against Lefty. all the lefties. It, it's just it's bound that one of the lefties is going to find something out of the three that he's going to three or four that he's going to have to go through. I think after Mike just said that, I'm going to put more money on EJ to win that. <laughs> I'm serious because, like, every time Mike is so sure of something, it's – look, if there's any time EJ could run a ladder, it's this time because he could make a shot for himself and he'll have it for the whole show, essentially, unless Kyle Sherman ends up winning and, 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 and ends up making the second show, which I don't see that happening. Uh, I, I e, EJ is going to bowl, you know, a uh, Knowles or Jones, in my opinion, and then it's going to be the only righty, and then he's going to be able to bowl against uh, a lot of lefties throwing urethane. Fa will be probably throwing urethane. Knowles probably be throwing urethane. Jesper will be throwing urethane. So I feel like at this point, like he has a, a legit chance to run a ladder being the only righty and able to like open the lane up for himself. Uh, I don't know. Flanagan thoughts on this nine man two show step ladder. If we had all the time in the world, I think we should sit around and pick each player and try to paint a picture of how they can win. Right. But we don't have all the time in the world. So I'm just going to pick a couple things. Okay. One thing is I can't believe Kyle Sherman's inside this, this, this show mm. or as good as they were on the left. And to look at all the right-handers that entered this tournament and somebody who's been banged up living in West Virginia, having a baby, but still practicing. He told me that the internet doesn't even hardly work where he is. He's out in the, he's out in the boonies. I think that's what you call it. He's out in the outskirts of town. And if, if they're streaming something on the internet, they can't even get on the internet on their phone because it'll screw up the streaming. So all he's doing is taking care of a baby, focusing on his business and bowling at the bowling center all the time. So shout out to him for making it. And when you look at that first show, as you mentioned, Rob, I think, being the, the great right hope, the only right hander on the show, if if they get nice for him, he could win that show. And he has past history in that building. He bowled the Cheetah Championship there in a yellow Columbia 300 jersey. I specifically remember this. And he bowled Dick Allen for the title. And that night he is when the YouTube channel was starting to really pop and the place was packed. And Sherman had everybody behind him, okay? And he might have everybody behind him on this show. And he could be feeding off that adrenaline. So I do like Sherman, and I know he's a St. Louis guy, and he's my boy, but I do like Sherman there. Then when you look at the second show here, anytime you have one of the big three on the side of the lane by themselves with no other traffic, and he would be the only motive person on the show more than likely, okay? Spangler didn't get much airtime last night. They didn't bring Spangler on that I noticed until after the match was over and EJ already won. And what Spangler had to say about EJ, bowling smart, making these right decisions on the show, and with having the momentum coming over from the other night, I don't know. I, I would put a taste, a small taste on EJ Tackett to, to run the lefties down. Um, because I just think that that's what could happen. So I like the right-handers here. I already got a taste, so I like I'm, it. I'm, you know, I'll take it. But I got to post comment out because people like to shit on me in the chat, and I want to defend myself here. Rob just pooped over all Dio for being the lefty. EJ doesn't get beat up for doing the same thing. Um, I think this is a little bit of a different situation in the fact that. Uh, Dio was bowling on a cheetah that was very high scoring and was the only lefty uh, on a very high scoring pattern. Uh, I think EJ having the whole right side to himself uh, is a little bit different in the fact that he's probably not going to be throwing urethane and he's not going to be firing it at the gutter and being able to stand on five for the whole show. Uh, but I do think not, not taking credit away from Dio, though, because I did it. I said he deserved his win. He did. He bowled great. But, like, hey, I'm calling a spade a spade. The scores were high. He was the only lefty. And the lefties have had the advantage. I mean, Joe, did you did you hear 
did you you know pay attention to the world championship top 16 did you hear the show i mean the lefties clearly have the advantage so i think i think when you're talking about ej tackett in that situation you're looking at it from the perspective of saying well the lefties probably have a you know the advantage in terms of what they got out there and he's going to you know he's going to go out and have to have to overcome that in a way i don't know if we've seen the lefties have the advantage in the arena bay though I don't True. know if we have. True. I don't know if we could say that right no, now. That's a fair point. It's a fair point. Yeah. Um. I. I think it's always been like that. And I think last week I, I actually made that comment. I think the left side's a little bit. It's a little bit. They're finicky in that bay. They are just the way the ball rolls into the pins. You could just see a lot of deflection if you watch the ball hitting the pins. But with that uh, said, you know, uh, Jesper did beat Belmo, and they have won two of the three titles. And if a lefty wins this one, it's going to be three out of four. So. Yeah. Good points. Yeah. yeah. All right, fellas, are we ready to wrap it up? It's listen, it's way past my bedtime here. I know you are both in a different time zone than me, but I'm going to be dying tomorrow morning. I hope the people appreciate this content tonight, but it was yeah, a good I show. Don't. It was a good show. I'm glad, I'm glad they decided to do it. Mike, we appreciate everything. Seriously. Uh, you know, good luck. Keep, uh, keep in touch here. You're welcome on any time. I think Mike, I think big Mike, I think Flanagan gives a very good, uh, third opinion to our debauchery and nonsense that we talk. I'm, I think I'm open. I'm I'm 100% open to Flanagan being a regular every week guest on the show to break down ball with us. I mean, especially during the season, I don't know if he'd want to come and deal with our antics in the <laughs> off season when like we're, we're arguing about just inane things in the bowling world. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the, in terms of the PBA season, you know, any Mike, if you want to come back next week, come back next week. You want to come on Sunday, come on Sunday. If, there's, if it's a good show and you want to jump on with us Sunday, let us know. And I meant what I said before. If Bowl TV ain't going to give a home to Mike Flanagan, sweep the rack and give a home to Mike Flanagan. So, uh, Mike, you just let us know, bro. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for the time. It was good to hear from you. I'm glad that the people got word on what's been going on, et cetera. Uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it was needed, and I, I told you that uh, behind the scenes as well. So, uh, I'm glad that people, you know, got word about what's going on with you. Uh, we gave the people an update. Betting wise, f- follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter if you want the betting advice. We'll be chopping it up on Twitter as always. Yeah, he's not gonna bet. Well, I gotta bet the shows, bro. We got we got shows. Dude, like to bet. I love two shows to bet. Like you know the, the the like I like I pointed out with that Kevin Williams bet. There's soft spots in these shows. There There's is soft spots in these shows, and if you watch and you pay attention and you find one of those soft spots, you can really hit them. You can really hit them hard. So, you know, I'm all about it. I'm going to be watching Flanagan. the shows myself. Final thoughts before we let you go? I just enjoyed talking some bowling. The first half an hour of the show, I hated talking about that stuff. But no but, uh, but I love talking some bowling. I appreciate you guys constantly doing your show. I don't know if I can come on every week, but – Hit me up. Let me, you know, what's going on. I'd love to talk some shop. I watch these shows and I have these weird observations and I try to tie it to history because I'm a historian of the game. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens here on, on these two shows. Uh, I'm going to enjoy watching them and, um, thanks for having me on. Uh, and I appreciate again, uh, all you guys are doing here and all your fans and all the people that continue to watch professional bowling and try to take it forward. Uh, that's what we need is more raving fans. Uh, and, and, Subscribe to Bowl TV. There's not enough subscribers. Uh, I know that I'm not working there right now. I'm still, again, just if you got here late, I am still under contract with Bowl TV, and I may still be used in the future. Um, just right now, it is a uh, it is a hiatus for a bit. Sorry, we didn't communicate it better to the audience uh, throughout the process. So, well, we just did. So uh, I know everybody misses you, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure if you do come back for a show, it'll be like the comeback. The comeback show would be like, uh, you know, when, um, you know, The Rock came back to WWE this past <laughs> year, you know, uh, even though Big Mike doesn't know a thing about any of that. So, uh, all right, guys. Well, we're going to we're going to wrap up here. We appreciate everybody. Hit us up social media. We'll be on Sunday talking world championships, two shows, nine man step ladder. Uh, and, I would we'll have to- our, and we'll have our regular breakdown of the whole Worst world. Of the week. Series, right? We're going to tell you who we want to ride with, who we're not riding with. Milk Carton. Uh, I'm sure Michael diving, we get to give out dumpster diving gold medal of the whole world series. That's going to be good. So yeah, definitely. Join yeah. Us on and I'm sure Michael talk betting and we'll have worst of the week. Cause there's a few uh, going on right now. Yo. Uh, Listen, I got two I'm, front contenders for worst of the week. 
I'm at um, I'm at exactly plus four hundred for the week right now. There was actually I thought I really I, I got to be honest. Something very positive happened during the pod tonight. There was actually a bet I forgot about that I won. So I had I I actually hit for more today than I thought, and I I thought it was much worse than it is. So I'm actually still at four plus four hundred going into these last two shows. I got EJ Tackett ticket to win. Uh, you know, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. And I'm going to AC next weekend for a dance competition. So whatever I end up with here for the weekend, we're rolling it right into AC, baby. We're rolling it right, right into AC. Here you okay? go. Which means will, basically we'll... I'm giving I'm giving it all back in one weekend. So uh, I like it. All good. All right, everybody. We'll talk to you. Take we'll care. Talk to you we'll see you guys Sunday night. Later, guys. You are now listening to Sweep the Rack Podcast featuring Brooklyn Rob and Big Mike.